I'm here in Indian Head where you can be cowboy for a day at the Valley View Guest Ranch. And we are going to meet the cowboy that's going to show us the ropes. And his name is Gordon Webster, owner of this here farm. So this used to be a working farm, grain farm, right? Yes, it did, yeah. And we've always had cattle and horses, so when we switched over to doing trailer rides, it really wasn't a big deal because we, I think we had six, seven horses anyway. So yeah. as our business grew, we just got more horses kind of thing. And how long have you been doing this? 17 years. Wow, wow. So tell me about the kinds of people that come to the Well, a lot ranch. of them are people that are, uh, you know, you have a friend come from some country and they just want to show them part of what Saskatchewan's like. We had a couple of young ladies from England came out here and the first thing they wanted to do when they passed Winnipeg was go for a horseback ride okay. in Western Canada. So they made it all the way here before they seen our sign. So. And as trail boss, what do you, how, do you, how do you work that? Well, I usually stay at the back and kind of keep law and order. And my little leader, she goes out front and, um, and we take them through. Like we usually take eight to nine people at a time. Okay. I, we have been known to take one or two. And where do you take them? Well, we take them through the, our coulee here that goes back towards Capel Valley. We have an hour ride or an hour and a half or a two hour ride or three if you want to go further. Wow. <clears throat> Most people can't uh, stand, <laughs> stand much more than an hour and a half. <laughs> they get a little sore? Well, some of them do, yeah. <laughs> and out of practice, right? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> but what about the people, you said y you can recognize horse people. Tell me about that. Well, some, you can tell some of the older people that have done it when they were kids went to school. You can, you can tell the minute they get up on the horse, if, you know, with the control. And the horse knows it, too. Yeah. And yeah. they also know if you're scared. So the best thing to do is don't be scared. Okay. That's fair enough, right? Yeah, because yeah. they can detect that? They can sense that in a heartbeat, yeah. Gordon, yeah. tell me, who are your friends here? Well, this, is, this horse over here is Jake. This is the new one my son just bought. But now it's Jake and Queen. Wow. One's about 19 and the other one's around 23 years old. Wow. They're, they're actually the ones we use for kids. Okay, because are they more gentle? Is that why? Yeah, they're old. they're like me. They're kind of slow moving. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Oh, beautiful. Yeah, he's a good old guy. Hello. I named him after the guy that owns him, Jake Sandercott, so he, uh, I can remember his name. Yeah, and you've also got some. I noticed some friends out here that aren't horses. Yeah, well, we got a, we got some heifers here we keep, and then this that cow over there. She thinks she's a person. Uh huh. You can tell she'd follow and you anywhere. What is what is your little friend this is, here? This is newly. This is a new investment. I got him for nothing. The price is right. Oh. He's pretty good. And and what? He just like he's a, he's basically a look at donkey. A look at donkey. Yeah. Okay, and that's we, different from other donkeys. He, how? Yeah, he's a look at donkey. <laughs> Actually, thinks he's a person. Just just look at it. Just look at it. Okay. The kids play with it and carry comb. <laughs> okay. I've actually had people pay me from the lake, come up and uh, give me 50 bucks for their grandchildren to carry coin. Oh. You get people, you get little guys, right? Yeah. And how does that work when you get the little kids? Well, we'll only take one or two. Like we had, we've had some pretty good horses for doing that job. Uh, we kind of haven't got too many right now. We, we used to do six-year-olds, but we had to move it up to eight-year-olds. Okay. Just for safety reasons. And, and then you have to, it's like a babysitting job on a horse. Okay. And they, we've been fortunate enough to not have any horrible things happen to us. I, be, I bet they love it though. I bet they oh, they love it. Oh, time. they love it. The parents love it. You can tell by the smiles. Yeah. They enjoy it every minute. Even the big people enjoy it too. And you get more than smiles, don't you? Yeah, we get the uh, thank you, yeah. So tell me about this thank you you have well, here. Well, we have a thank you here from a little group of people from Lake Katapa that uh, oh, just that brought us back awesome. a couple of days later and showed us the pictures of all the horses. And, and, okay. they, know the, and they know the horses by name. Some right. of them don't come back for two years and they still name their horse. That's great. And they drew little pictures of horses and yeah, smiley they, faces. Yeah, and they can That's stand awesome. there on the yard and look at the, at the ducks and the geese. and the Now, I bet they keep coming back year after year, don't they? Yeah, we've got people that have been coming here since they, were, you know, they started out at six years old and they're, they're down the road 15 or 16 years. So. Karen, this is where we uh, run our uh, trail ride out of. Oh, okay. Wow. We have all our saddles and uh, all the stuff that requires to take you for a horseback ride. So now I know I'm in cowboy country. Pretty much so, yeah. So these are all the saddles you have, right? Yeah, we have, well, I think there's about 28 altogether, something like that. But we have little saddles for little people and 
Okay. Bigger saddles for bigger people. Okay, so the same saddle fits any horse, it's just the person you're fitting. Yeah, well, and we have smaller horses for small people too with small saddles. So we kind of not, some of these horses, ponies? some of the horses get the same saddle all the time. Okay. Well, these are beautiful too, the yeah, working in them. Saddles, yeah. yeah, and what else do you have? I have no idea what's in a tack room. Well, your blankets and then all your paraphernalia for your bridles and okay. stuff like that. And so this goes under the saddle? This goes under the saddle with the pads, yeah. Saddle yeah. blanket. Saddle blanket. Protect the horse? Yes, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Okay, and then the saddle goes on and... Yeah, and then and pretty much it. Our lead shanks and our halters and all that kind of stuff for doing the little job. These these doors open up out here to our uh, hitching rail. Oh, okay. And there usually isn't snow on the floor like that. <laughs> today there is and it's a little Something cold. we got to live with. It's pretty much, yeah. Right. Yeah. And no, we have some buffalo <laughs> remnants of 100 years ago or whenever they do think. Okay, well, you know, buffalo says prairie. Nothing says buffalo like prairie like buffalo right so we've got kids that are coming out here in the summer we've got tourists from yeah. all over the world pretty much yeah right and although you're you're fairly close to Regina it doesn't take too long to get here I would think this would be an awesome destination for a, a weekend picnics do you do picnics well we will do we do wiener roast like we'll take them for a wagon ride to the coolies and do a horseback thing at the same time and then we'll do a wiener roast down there we have a little spot where we can uh, just everybody sits around the picnic table in the fire and do a wiener roast and oh, that's awesome. load them up and haul them back again kind of thing. Load them up and haul them back. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> well, you have a bunch of animals, though, not just horses and, and cattle, right? Yeah, we got our horses and cattle, but we got, you know, the donkeys and uh, that's the biggest. And we got a little pig out we inherited here. Porky, we call him. <laughs> He's live entertainment, too. So. Hey, Porky. Oh, He's kind of a shy little guy. That's our pet pig, Porky. Well, hello, Porky. He gets he gets to roam the yard in the summertime. Oh yeah. Yeah, and he comes and he comes back in the barn at night. And you keep him just to entertain the. He's guests? another another one of those look at things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that's awesome because people can come and they get a sense of what a real farm would be well, like. Oh yeah, and the cats are very important. I think we had 30 some kittens here last year, <laughs> which I managed to get I managed to give away mo all of them, I think, too, all of about 4 or 5. So, you called this cowboy country. Well, it is for me because I I'm not into grain farming anymore. And we've always this farm has always had cattle on it, and I I think it's probably been down as low as one horse and we we're up to we've been as high as 28 horses. So, yeah, cuz my grandfather was here before we come along, so Wow, so how long have, has this farm been here in the it's, family? It's been a family farm for 104 years. Wow. Okay, so the new kid on the block like me, I'm lucky you're even talking to me, huh? No, no, we like strangers, yeah. No, that's good. <laughs> that's good because you said you've met. Do you have any funny stories about amazing people that you've met here that have come out to? Well, some of the most interesting people, are there. we've had some Chinese groups come through, and, uh, and most of them can't believe, that, well, some of them couldn't believe that we could stop down there and eat Saskatoon. Oh, yeah? off the wagon and just, you know, have a good feed of Saskatoon. And the, the lady that was running it, she commented they were still talking about it when they got on the plane. <laughs> the first thing they wanted to know if they were safe to eat. Oh, of course. Because over there, I guess that's not a common thing. But, uh, yeah. And they couldn't believe how big there was, how big this world of ours is. And there's no people here. <laughs> well, there's very few, that's well, for sure. Well, compared to some places, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of nice. So do you ever have any issues with the communication then, especially because I think you need to keep well, law and order as a trail boss, right? Yeah, we've had the odd time when uh, we've had to learn, learn to speak a language in about four minutes, which we don't. They, <laughs> they usually have an interpreter with them. So okay, I was going to say, how many languages do you speak now? I'm fluent in just about English. <laughs> so I'm not good at that one. How many languages can you say whoa in? <laughs> yeah. Well, they know, you can tell by looking, at they follow you and just, they want to stay alive, so they do what you want. <laughs> the interpreter goes through the process to tell them all the things you have to do. Okay. So they usually have one good interpreter. And it's, it's mostly a lot of fun. That's what it but, is. but everybody just has a lot of fun. Yeah. Right. Well, when you had somebody that's never been near a horse, never test a horse, we get some Japanese people that have never touched a live horse. Yeah. And they want to, you know, they want to know if they can touch it. And then they usually like having a picture taken with a cowboy hat on it. Of course. Yeah, so you look like you've made it out west, and then the Lone Ranger for a little bit. Yeah. Oh darn! I should have bought a cat. Well, you have cowboy to do that this, this summer. You'll have to do that. Okay. So the kids get to go out and interact with you, with the animals. You have. Well, so usually when they're through riding, they get off the horses and they still spend the next half hour walking around the yard looking at the rabbits because we've got rabbits running around and some rabbits in cages. They look at the rabbits, 
And then if you can believe it or not, we have some laying hens, and they'll stand there and admire our laying hens. So we have peacocks and guinea hens. Oh, wow. And, no, and some roosters around around here. So there's a little bit of everything here. Well, you know, I'd gawk at a laying hen, too, because I don't think I've ever seen one up close. Yeah, well, these, these guys are, they know their name, I think, too. Introduce me to your friends, Gordon. Well, a good-looking one is Gary Peacock, oh. and this is uh, Morris over there. So and Those are the only ones that have names, and the rest of them are there's just a pair of ducks, and then there's five guinea hens in here. Very loud guinea hens, I might add. Well, Gary is pretty amazing. Gary is pretty impressive. He knows it, too. He does he? Yeah. <laughs> and tell me about the other peacock well, that you Morris, got. Well, Morris, we just found him uh, last fall. He was out a friend of mine's place running out in the field, so we managed to catch him later in the fall. He did, okay. must have got away from somebody. So you rescue him and... Well, we just rescued him or he didn't ever made it. Oh, that's awesome. And, and so the kids come and they get to... Well, these, when spring comes along, all these guys go outside and roam, roam the yard. <laughs> they do whatever they want. I keep some of the little guys locked up, but uh, for the most part, they just do whatever they want to do. And they're very talkative and beautiful, too. But Gary's impressive. Gary's very impressive. It's too he's, bad we can't see. He's named after one of my he's friends, and he's kind finish. of an impressive guy, too, so that's, that's why he's named like that. Well, Gordon, thanks so much for the tour. Now, if you want to see all of this stuff, you got to come see it for yourself because the camera just can't do it justice. Gordon, thanks so much for it's, taking the time to spend with me today. It's been a pleasure with you people. You have to come back when it's 80 above and we'll take Greg for a horseback ride. I will. Because it looks like a cowboy to me. I'm here with Barry Donaldson, and we are at the Carry the Kettle First Nations School, yes. where you're actually a real blacksmith. Yes. Okay. So tell us how you got into that, because it's not something you think about very much anymore. No, it, it's not. It was actually a dying art, but I got involved with it through a fellow out of Iracana, Alberta, mm -hmm. by the name of Ib Jensen, and he came from Denmark, and he's a master blacksmith. Okay. And he and said, come on out one day. Let's see if you like this stuff. And you obviously do. I have been doing it now for just over 10 years. Okay, and you also, so you do it for fun, um, build things like tools, like you're building now. What is this? Well, this is the beginning of a sword. Okay. So I'm basically showing that we can make anything that's solid, malleable. Mm -hmm. So that's what that end started to look like, and this is what it's coming down to, to become the tip of the sword. Okay, so tell me about what a blacksmith would have been in the day. The blacksmith was the central shop in all the towns. Everything that was needed was done with the blacksmith hundreds of years ago. They would make all the nails to build the houses, all the tools that were required. Mm -hmm. And any tools that they needed to make yokes and wagon parts, any of that stuff, if they didn't have it, they made it. They even made tools to make tools, right? Yes. <laughs> I know, exactly. you were showing me something here that this is for Making nails. Making nails, that's amazing. So it's just a little form. And it's the old square nails that you would normally see in the older houses that are over 150 years old or so. They right. were all built together. So it's fascinating those. that you make a tool first to make yes, a tool. you bet. Okay, and you do workshops too, don't you? I do, I conduct workshops out of my farm. Uh, we do little three and a half or three hour sessions. We do eight hour sessions and 16 hour and what sessions. And what kind of people take those workshops? I've had a, quite a diverse group already. I've had younger adults come in, I've had some older people, mm -hmm. and just tourists that want to check it out, see what it's worth, and they walk away with a little something in their hand, and they're quite happy. Well, it's funny because I came across somebody on my way into the school today that was telling me all about something you showed me, and they were over the moon excited yes, about it. Yes. So you must get that a lot. It's unique. They go, well, let's check it out and see what they're really talking about. And then when they see you can take something like this and bend it and shape it, it is rather unique. Okay, so we've showed the old tools, but what really piqued my interest about what you're doing is 
you've turned an age-old craft mm -hmm. into art. Look at this. So this is something that you made, right? Yes. And that you can make now mm -hmm. using blacksmithing, right? Is the there same a... general artwork to it. There is heating involved. It doesn't involve the forge. Okay. Can you show me some of what that's about? I can. So this takes a lot of experience, yeah? It does a little bit, but it's also a learning process that's fairly quick to learn, and it's not that hard to do. Well, it's amazing. I can see the art going in now. Yes, to actually start to brighten up the metal mm -hmm. and to actually soften it somewhat so that we can work with it. Okay. A little bit more. Set that down. This is adding veining to it. Yeah, you can see that it. Comes it's beautiful. Through onto the other side, so it shows up on both sides of the rose petal. And you make it look so easy. A few years of practice. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure anybody can do it after about 10 minutes of just trying it out. And the best part of it is the metal is very forgiving, so it'll still look wonderful even if you think it doesn't look that great when you're doing it. Well, the little flaws look more like nature anyway, right? Exactly. So this is awesome. So these are the petals you made. Tell us how you got to this point. Because this is, this is we're making the flower, right? The finished right? product, yes. Okay. I start out with 22 to 18 gauge, depending on how thick I want the rose to be. So this is steel? Steel, yes. Okay. It's just a plated steel. You can use straight black steel. I find that this works a little nicer for the texture that I'm after. Okay. I draw the patterns out, so I've actually got pre-cut templates, and I draw them out on the Okay, steel. and they're numbered? Yes, I cut them out in numbers for the people that are learning, so they'll understand which way that they have to go in. Okay. So we start out, instead of one to four, we go four to one. Okay, and so that it's, it's cut, and then we do the hammering that you just saw, which is amazing because you can almost see that starting to take yes. shape. So what happens from here? Well, I have to make a stem okay. that I'm going to mount them to, and then pin it and start heating each individual petal. Okay. So to how does the, how the do rose. you make this? Show us well, what the I stem start comes out from. with a stem. I pre-cut the steel rod. Okay. These are about seven inches, and it's three eighths steel rod, and I grind an end down to allow me to place okay. the petals on. Okay. So let's see that. Okay. So I'll set this into the vise first. And he makes all this look really easy, but it's not. And what I have to do is actually punch the holes in each one first. Okay. So I'll just grab my wood again. Sorry. So I find approximately the center. Now, it doesn't have to be perfect because the roses aren't perfect, but some people might argue that with me. So you just pop a hole in each one of them. Yes. I just punch a small hole in them. And that will allow them to slide onto our rod. Okay. And I don't necessarily have to make it bigger because I want the metal to actually shape around it. Okay. So how did you first come to do a rose? Well, I started out in Iracana at the Pioneer Acres museum where we actually had a an old time blacksmith shop with all of the old equipment power driven by mm -hmm. a single lung engine and it drove the power shaft and all the old equipment was belt driven and the fellow that I learned from was Ib Jensen and he was doing flowers he was actually the blacksmith that taught me the general skills of how to hammer and so on and then there was a lady that I got to meet that was doing the roses. So I followed into her footsteps. Oh, I see. And she was the one that actually taught me how to start doing these. So I just expanded and started making other things as well. So next we put, we've got the holes and we've got the petals. Yes. So I'm going to basically line it up onto it. Mm -hmm. Right, I'm going to 
tap this down a bit. And I'll take the next one. And I actually offset them mm -hmm. slightly. So that's why they have right. different counts. Oh, I see. Okay. And follow the numbers. Exactly. I need to keep it simple. Because there, there are go. some days. Ha, ha, ha. But this is really cool. You can see it taking shape. Yes, this is the actual pre-rows prior to being finally shaped. Okay, do we get to light something on fire now? Well, of course. <laughs> That's the best part of this All whole right. process. <laughs> okay, what I will do is I have my torch preset. Just going to turn up my heat a bit. What I do with the rows now is, once these are all set, I've got a backing on that rod so it won't go down any farther. I'm going to use the rod as the rivet. Okay. can make a rivet to hold it down in place. It takes a little bit of time. The best part is it's all slow and easy to work with. So similar to the forge, I've just now confined the flame to a smaller piece. What I'm doing is I'm actually hitting the outside of that rod to broaden the steel out. Mm -hmm. And I'll just keep applying the heat as I go so that I can control how the rod comes down. The term that I'm of what I'm doing is actually called upsetting. I'm trying to compress the metal or steel at the same time as it's going down, so it's actually getting broader. So I'm using more steel in that length. I see, yeah. Uh, well, I don't find it upsetting at all. <laughs> so I've been getting down into Let's it. See. I now have to start heating individuals because I don't want to overheat the petals themselves yet. Right, yet. So where Not does yet. it go once you've got this on? Once I set the rivet, all the pieces will stay fairly tight. So now I've got my rivet set so that it won't pop apart on us and come up. So I will just reach here and grab my other pliers. So what I want to do now is I want to actually start taking the center of the rows, which is that centerpiece there. Okay. And all the flowers always turn. have the internal petal. And that's what's going to start determining how the rest of the rose comes out. So I just uh, want So here's where we get artistic. Yes. It's however you want to perceive it. Be one, it. With, Be the one with the flower. Oh, wow. So I'm heating it up. It just pops up right away. And it's interesting the smell that that's coming it's off that It's actually part of the coating of the steel. Okay. So I want to heat each individual piece, yet still keep the heat on the rest of it. Okay. So you would just keep doing this until you had each petal to the shape that you wanted. Exactly. It. Wow, that's amazing. Now, one of the things that you were talking about was um, how these could be used for memorials, and how do you treat these afterwards, after you've made the entire thing? Because I coat them in natural beeswax. Okay. Uh, and the beeswax, and then what makes it the red color? Well, I actually dip them in paint, Okay. or you can spray paint them. Uh, you can do acrylic dips, any mm -hmm. of that that you wish. Okay, and you have some that are just, you left sort of that natural? That I just left as black. Okay. And how do you treat those then to keep them from rusting or? Just the same process. Heat them up and coat them in a beeswax. Okay. Because the beeswax is Mother Nature's sealant. Okay. There's an actual bee supplier. They make their own honey and everything just outside of Quapel. And that's where I was getting my wax from. Okay. So I get it from them. All right. And it's a very dark wax compared to what most people would see as their honey. But you said if it started to rust on you a little bit, I was shocked at what you told me I could use. 
Well, it's generally, I've had some roses start to rust out about three years, you start seeing a little bit of wear. Uh -huh. And the way to treat them, if they're not painted, if they're just a straight black rose, is to pour your favorite beverage, Coke or Pepsi, <laughs> whichever one you prefer, so I'm covering both genres <laughs> off, and you dip it in there. Because they are actually a slight acid, and what it does is it will start to clean up the metal. So that's, that's kind that's of frightening. That's what we're drinking, isn't I know. It? It's isn't frightening. It? Stick to water. So let me ask you then, Barry, if for somebody that maybe was on the fence about taking a workshop or getting involved, what would you tell them? You've got to try it. Yeah. That's all you can do. Yeah. You, you won't know until you try it and see if you can express your artistic self a little more or just take out some aggressions. And this is one of the processes that I wound up doing. Okay, and what's the first thing you would have them do then? I would go through the safety part of the entire process first, whether it's that makes sense. just the heat here, the same as doing the forging and so on. So of course we have our protective clothing on. They have the glasses that we would normally do if you're participating in it, if you're going to be doing any striking of metal and so on. I'm rocking the look now. Of course. <laughs> okay. Well, anything else that you want to leave people with then if they want to come out and see a workshop or get some more information on how this history has become art? Well, they can give me a call. Okay. I have, uh, we'll give them all well. your information. You and bet. The, I have gift certificates as well from yep. starting out as something as simple as a three hour workshop and it's only $35 and you can make leaves, key rings, whatever you wish just to get an idea of how you can take something solid and make it right. malleable enough to form something and then have it go back to being solid again. And they can get some stories along the way, right? Oh, definitely. <laughs> no problem. And the history of the blacksmithing, which is always... Which is what I'm fascinated there. about. So I'm going to catch up with some more of that with you. Um, I want to thank you for sharing all of this with oh, everybody. Um, I'm still fascinated. In fact, I'm going to steal his torch and try this myself when we're done. Thanks, Barry. Thank you.